There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? This video was made possible due to those who support me on Patreon. And I'd like to give a big shout out to patrons Conrad Truitt, Dan Ray, Flake, Joseph Abrams, Kyle Kramer, Logan Cottingham, Majin Weebu, Mariah, Sophia Narwitz, and Stephen Dillon. Thank you all for your support. Hello those new to my channel and returning macabros, and welcome to my latest recurring series entitled The Craft Of, which will serve as a crash course on traditional 3X structure, which is the script structure that the vast majority of Hollywood films released over the last god knows how many decades have utilized. As always, if you enjoy this video or some of my others, make sure to subscribe, like, turn on notifications, comment, share, and consider supporting me on Patreon. If you haven't checked out the previous entries of this series, I would recommend doing so, as I will be building off each entry as we continue. Keep in mind that there may also be spoilers for not only the films I will be discussing in this episode, but the films I discussed in those episodes, so make sure to check the description so you don't get any of them spoiled for you. Before we discuss the final of the five major plot points, today we will be discussing what is known as the third act twist. The third act twist occurs shortly after the end of the second act, and its function is to initiate a reaction in our protagonist that leads to them mobilizing the story towards the climax. I know that's a bit vague, but I think it'll make a lot more sense once we start to go over some examples. The reason I don't consider the third act twist to be a major plot point is because while 99.9% .9 of films that utilize 3 act structure will include the five major plot points, only certain films will need to utilize the third act twist. For example, in The Matrix, after Morpheus is taken prisoner by Agent Smith, Neo and Trinity set out to rescue him. Here, we have the end of the second act heading right into the climax, since, well, of course Neo and Trinity are going to risk it all to save Morpheus. The end of the second act naturally leads to the protagonist's do or die decision, which brings about the climax. However, in some films, one additional step is needed to bridge the gap between the end of the second act and the climax. A perfect example of the third act twist can be found in 2006's The Departed. Thus, I feel compelled to use this film as an example, even though I fucking hate this movie. I really should have used Infernal Affairs, the Hong Kong film it's a remake of, but I already made the thumbnail and I have no work ethic, so fuck it. The film tells the story of the cat and mouse game between Billy Costigan, a state trooper acting as a mole in Boston's Irish mob, and Colin Sullivan, a mob associate acting as a mole in the Massachusetts at state police as they try to ascertain each other's identity. The end of the second act sees mob boss Frank Costello being killed along with the majority of his crew after they are betrayed by Colin. Billy and Colin then meet face to face, Billy not knowing that Colin is Costello's mole, and it seems as if the film is over. Costello and his crew are dead, Billy no longer has to be undercover, and Colin seems like he's going to get away with it. All's well that ends well, right? Well, Fuck no. You're telling me the film spends two hours building up the confrontation between these two bastards and then just drops it? Of course we can't let that stand. But then how do we get there? How do we initiate the final confrontation between the two men? And this is where the third act twist comes in. After Colin leaves his office, Billy spots an envelope on Colin's desk, one he had written on earlier in the film, while he was out one of the mob's hideout holes. Thus, Billy puts two and two together, realizing Colin is the mole, which sets up the film's climactic showdown. As I'm sure you're aware, this is a pretty common beat found in a lot of crime mystery or thriller films. The detective believes they solved the case, but then they remember some small detail that makes them realize they have the wrong man, and they rush to apprehend the real culprit, or some shit like that. Again, this is not necessary in every film. It completely depends on the nature of the end of the second act, whether the protagonist is faced with a dilemma that they set out to confront immediately, or where it appears as if the primary conflict has been resolved and you need to kick the plot back into gear. In The Departed, the third act twist comes in the form of a plot development, not necessarily a shift in characterization. However, there are some cases where the third act twist, instead of acting as simply a plot turn, results in a character beat for our protagonist, which in turn has them undergo a change of heart. In 2005's Wedding Crashers, best friends John and Jeremy crash weddings in order to sleep with women. Things become complicated when John falls for Claire, who, of course, 
is already involved with another man. John and Jeremy spend the weekend with Claire and her family, where John is able to win Claire over. However, John and Jeremy are exposed as deceptive wedding crashers, resulting in Claire forsaking John. John and Jeremy return home, but Jeremy, having fallen in love with Claire's batshit insane yet incredibly hot sister Gloria, becomes engaged, leading to a rift between the two friends. The end of the second act sees John, the woman he loves marrying another man, and no longer on speaking terms with his best friend, fall into the pressure crashing weddings on his own. But, of course, we the audience know John has to end up with Claire. But again, how do we get there? What causes John to decide to risk it all to get Claire back? Jazz? What the fuck do you want? John decides to visit Chaz the man who had taught Jeremy about the art of crashing weddings. However, instead of some confident ladies man, Chaz is an obnoxious mama's boy who has graduated from crashing weddings to funerals, taking advantage of women's grief in order to seduce them. Upon realizing just how pathetic Chaz is, John realizes that he doesn't want to end up like that, which in turn results in him risking it all to try and win Claire back. The third act twist functions in the same way it does in The Departed, as a bridge between the end of the second act and the climax. If John never goes to see Chaz, he never tries to win back Claire. However, in The Departed, the third act twist initiates no change in our protagonist. But in Wedding Crashers, the plot turn of John realizing Chaz is a pathetic dirtbag initiates a character change within John, thus prompting his final do or die decision. Now something to note is that, well, I guess in the case of Wedding Crashers, you don't need the Chaz scene, right? In The Departed, Billy needs to find the envelope to kick off the climax. He can't just all of a sudden develop clairvoyance and realize Colin is the mole. But in Wedding Crashers, John doesn't necessarily need to visit Chaz. He could just change his mind and go after Claire, right? I mean, sure, but that would be super contrived. If he is wallowing in a suicidal depression and then all of a sudden is like, actually no, the audience would be like, like what, what the fuck? I bring this up because it is at this point between the end of the second act and the climax where the character has to make a do or die decision where I see many writers rely on contrivance to initiate the finale. You have to add in that step to sell his change of heart to the audience. Now, while I colloquially refer to the plot point as the third act twist, it doesn't necessarily have to be a twist in the conventional sense, akin to a like a twist ending or a surprise ending, if you will. It's simply any sort of plot turn that sets up the final showdown. One of my favorite films, 1992's Unforgiven, tells the story of ex-outlaw William Money, who takes a bounty to hunt down two cowboys who disfigured a prostitute. Will takes the job both for the financial security of his family as well as an attempt to find redemption for his past crimes as a ruthless criminal. Will sets out on his journey with his old friend Ned Logan and cocky hotshot the Schofield Kid. The end of the second act sees Will and the Kid succeeding in killing the Cowboys and receiving their payment. While most films reach the end of their second act with the protagonist in their highest moment of crisis, Unforgiven actually has him coming out on top. The Cowboys are dead and the Assassins are awarded their bounty. I mean, this is ignoring the immense amount of existential dread they are struggling with, but eh, whatever, who cares. So at this point, the film is a ostensibly over. The main conflict is seemingly resolved. However, then Will learns that Ned, who had a change of heart earlier in the film and decided to forgo their mission, was captured and tortured to death by the town's sadistic sheriff, Little Bill. A furious Will sets out to confront Little Bill and take his revenge, which serves as the climax of the story. While in The Departed and Wedding Crashers, the twist results in the audience and protagonist learning certain information together, in Unforgiven, we the audience know that Ned is being held prisoner by Little Bill before Will and the Kid even kill the second cowboy. Thus, rather than the twist being a surprise to both us and the protagonist, it's almost as if the audience is waiting for the other shooter drop, if you will, preemptively setting up the third act twist, Will learning of Ned's death. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a twist in the more traditional sense. Also note, like in Wedding Crashers, the twist doesn't only function as a plot turn, but also as a character turn, with Will giving up on potential redemption and accepting he will never be forgiven for his past crimes, a la the film's title. There is also a brilliant piece of visual storytelling present in this scene as well. Throughout the film, Will mentions several times that he was drunk when he committed his heinous crimes as a notorious outlaw, demonstrating that, for him, alcohol is a symbolic representation of his wickedness. But upon learning of Ned's death, we see Will drink again, signifying
signifying that he has made the decision to revert to his old self, at least for a while, so he can take his revenge. A major character shift is demonstrated with a simple swig of booze. So in summary, the third act twist takes place between the end of the second act and the climax, and its function is to bridge the two together by initiating a plot and or character development that facilitates the protagonist bringing the story to its climax. Again, I feel like I do a really bad job of giving a succinct definition of this one, so I hope the examples I used communicate it well. To reiterate, the third act twist is the one plot point that is completely dependent on the specifics of your story. You may need to utilize it, but if you don't need one, don't sweat it. However, if say you're getting feedback that your protagonist's do or die decision that leads into the climax doesn't ring true or seems random or contrived, you may want to consider adding a third act twist in order to sell it to the audience. Make the protagonist's decision more coherent and justified. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Craft Of. We have one more episode left in this series in which we'll discuss the fifth and last of the five major plot points the climax, where the protagonist crosses the point of no return and the main thematic conflict is settled one way or the other. Once again, make sure to subscribe, like, share, comment, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you again for all of your support, and I'll see you next time.